Welcome to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy, Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society, whose mission is creating unity through music. And as I also like to say, making connections through music with the intention of bringing peace. And today I am in Studio One at the Worldwide Headquarters of the Planetary Gig Society. And our guest is half a world away in Korea, and I'm not exactly even sure where in Korea, but it is such a privilege and honor and just fun and wonderful to be able to connect again with a great friend, fabulous musician, Alan Holmes from Korea. Alan, thanks for taking the time to talk again. Oh, thanks so much, Jeff. Glad to be here. Yeah, I I have to say that when I first got this uh, podcast project started, I really didn't know what I was doing and or who I was going to talk with, and and you and you know other people and um, were were willing to to kind of go out on a limb in a sense and have a conversation. And uh, you were here in Studio One at the time, I remember, and we we talked. It was like inter in one of the first interviews we've done and and uh you know we've always connected so well through music and friendship and you you know you were my harmonica teacher and among others but taught me a lot of good stuff when i was taking lessons and it made a lot of difference so always a always a great thing to be able to to catch up with you mm, likewise so um we were just you know kind of on the internet or something or I, I i know what happened i you posted something about a big bass chord harmonica or something like that and i replied and said it was good or maybe i subscribed to your channel and then you re replied back on facebook messenger and so then we got in this conversation about what's been going on recently and you said you'd like to you know tee it up to do another uh, conversation and so here we are and uh can't wait to kind of get into the new stuff that you've been thinking about. Sure, sure. The, this last year, and, and I guess we are, uh, it's January 1 here at least. I guess it's still, it's still last year there. How about that? <laughs> oh, I think so, it's January 1. So, it, it's January 1. Oh, it's Jan it's January oh it is. So it's January. Oh, yes. Yeah, you know, I never get dates right. <laughs> <laughs> so that is that is so like me, especially. So, so yeah, I'm dyslexic. I get it's 2020. Dates right. so, uh, 2020. So, both so places. Yeah. 2020, both of us. Okay. Well, that's good. At least we're in the same year. Um, so, so, well, a lot happened last year for me. Um, so, so, you know, when we did the first interview, uh, you talked about uh, your experiences with Victor Wooten and, and how he described music as a living entity. And that's something that I've thought about for a long time, um, you know, before I'd heard it, but, but that somehow cemented it in my head in a different way. And I've been, I've been thinking about that a lot and I, and I really believe it. I believe that the, the music is a living spirit. It's alive and that some people that, devote themselves to it, that, that practice, that um, you know, are able to have a relationship with the spirit and learn from it. And, and I, I believe that there is you know, sort of a collective, um, how do I describe it? There, there, there's sort of a, 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 a collective perception of what's good music and what's bad music. Of course, there are individual um, likes and dislikes i mean everyone right. has their preference but but um we can all agree that there are certain musicians that are great yeah. you know that, that their music will never die and 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 so i so i do think that there is sort of, and how how can there be sort of this collective perspective um which points to something that's greater like that it's a living entity so so and that this is not really new i mean nietzsche talked about pan bioism with everything being alive and and you know everything that has molecular movement might be alive everything creates vibration that has any sort of heat that's not at absolute zero so so there are a lot of theories and, and um beliefs about this but but i have also kind of devised this other thought I also believe that there is what, and I, for lack of a better word, I haven't come up with a better uh -huh, word yet. Yeah. Uh, but anti-music, 
I huh. believe that there is another living entity that's purpose is to destroy music and, and or, or to counter maybe, maybe destroy, maybe counter. So like yin uh, and, and yang. And the exactly, exactly. And, and the purpose of music is to destroy or counter anti-music and both exist and they actually coexist. And I've learned more recently that uh, they, they help each other grow. <laughs> Whoa. So, so, um, uh, and I believe that they're both very much alive, and, and, and there are many musicians out there that choose the anti-music route. Huh. And, and, and I believe that each of these, each of these entities has minions. Um, <clears throat> for example, the, the minions of music would be uh, uh, pitch, tone, rhythm, composition, skill, uh, uh, passion or emotion, huh. I think – I think, uh, you know, uh, the ability to collaborate with the other musicians, all of these things are part of what makes music beautiful. And I've devoted my life. I mean, my life's work has been to, to try to make the most beautiful music I can that's just beautiful for, us, for its own aesthetic. It's, um, there's no ego. There's no other function other than to just make beautiful music. And that, that has been sort of my goal. But more recently, I sort of <laughs> kind of been focusing on this anti-music side, too, and, and seeing how, how they interconnect and relate. Um, whereas before, I just like, oh, I hate that, you know, or I don't want to listen to that. Or oh. here, you know, here's here. Because anti-music has a lot of minions, too. I mean, I mean, passion without skill is something that I, that I hear all the time, um, you know, something that's very ego driven uh, yeah. to me just po pollutes music. I have no interest in it. Something that's mm, maybe materialistic or produced like the intent behind where the music comes from is a key ingredient to whether mm. it falls under music or anti-music. For me. I've, I've so that's, yeah, I've certainly heard that kind of thing before. I mean, just a, a little bit on this. I mean, I, I have heard Victor talk about, and he says in his book, the music lesson, uh, that music is sort of a, this entity, and I've talked with other people who, you know, say when they're playing, sometimes they just don't know w how they really played that, but it was like music was playing them almost. Um, and another little interesting point that ties into your minions comment is that, you know, when Victor talks about, you know, what music is and and how music is taught. You know, we focus on pitch a lot, but he has these ten other qualities, such as rhythm and space and and tone and all these different aspects of music that really kind of create the whole thing, that creates the whole sound or experience, whatever it is. So that that kind of ties in. Well, how did you come to sort of this this these feelings? I know you had some recent sort of profound experiences. Um, and how, how did you, how did this develop, you know, your, in your thinking? Well, um, I, I traveled through Central and South America and, and played with some incredible musicians. And, um, when I was in Belize, there was a, I was part of a, 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 a in a community, it was a Garufuna community and it was Garufuna settlement day that I was there. And so the, the whole village uh, drums and sings, and they all know all the songs. And so the day was spent just playing music all the time. And, and the drummers are incredible. And, and it's um, and there were some young people that I that I heard playing these drums, and, and the skill was just. I mean, it brought me to tears hearing mm -hmm. them play. And there'd be little kids playing on chairs, and I mean, everyone drums. <laughs> so. But, but there was a thing uh, that I saw while they were playing uh, on the beach. There was a, one of the villagers got a hold of a maraca, and he was drunk. And, and he was not uh, – he probably was skilled. He probably was very good, but I think the alcohol was, was in the way for him. Right, right. And so he was playing the maraca, and there were two drummers that were playing for everyone. And he would, like, shake the maraca, like, right in their faces, and it was not – it was not in tempo. It wasn't, <laughs> it wasn't was cool. Off. Yeah. Well, well, 
I don't know. I don't know if I'd say that because <laughs> okay. because what happened? What happened was very beautiful. I mean, and, and actually, the drummers had to change the way that they played to deal with it. They had to like. They ha- I could almost visualize or see what they were doing. They had to like play with more structure and with more rhythmic accuracy. They couldn't take maybe maybe as many uh, risks because they had to sort of weather this maraca plane and and he was literally like shaking it in their faces you know he was um and they were just holding firm and it was very beautiful it was like it was like anti-music and music sort of clashing in a way that created something that was new and different and more beautiful um and eventually someone took the maraca from him somebody that was you know not drunk and really good and then it sort of and then the drummers were able to relax and 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 play differently they, they also the, the dancers would come and, and the dancers steps dictate the rhythm which was something i've never really seen it was really huh. beautiful so the drummers play the the, the dancers kind of lead the rhythm um but um so that so that again it's the yin and yang as you as you aptly described it, it, it it's the the coexistence of these entities that can not always but has the potential to be conducive to something very beautiful. Yeah, Victor's also totally about yin and yang. You go to Woot in the Woods and there's yins and yang <laughs> signs all over the place. Yeah, I've had some conversations yeah, wanna... with him about that. That's so very cool. So what Well, there there's I mean there's a lot of musicians that I and I I, I guess I committed not to mentioning names cuz you know there's very famous musicians that I despise. And 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 I I I make people very angry when I talk about this because <laughs> I, I feel like that the, the music that they play, that's often extremely popular, is is driven by anti music minions. Wow! I mean, it's ego driven and it it lacks depth. It's maybe about making money or about uh, I don't know self promotion or or. So I think it's very easy to kind of get lost in anti music, and I believe that there is. Just proportionally, there's a lot more anti-music than there is music. Huh. Um, I do believe that everything in nature is music. Yeah, every insect, every bird, even like a blue jay that's sort of screaming, you know, or a, a cat that's like about to fight or something. I, I believe that all of that falls under the entity of music. Fortunately, well, Victor would <laughs> so agree we have, with you on that too. We, we have nature on our side, you know, and um, but but again, I. I you know, I, I think that the coexistence of them is is essential. So when I hear really bad music, I mean, I'll still say, "Oh gosh, you know, that's hard for me to hear. Or that's sort of polluting me right now." But 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 um, I, I have been trying very hard to have a a new understanding and appreciation for the dynamic between the two. So, uh, well, I mean, that's pretty deep. I don't exactly know how to process it i mean i'm i'm sort of learning guitar as you know now and i feel sometimes like it's maybe influenced by anti music or you know maybe when you get together with a group of people and everybody's been drinking a little bit but you're having fun playing songs so i don't know that maybe that's anti music too the minions of not not really intentional playing other than maybe it's fun it's the intention is to have fun I think I think fun could be a minion of both. <laughs> <laughs> I think I, I think potentially I, it is it is a beautiful you know it's it could be a, a very fun experience to play beautiful music and um, but I think fun can also maybe uh, uh, you know get in the way and, and make the music sort of I don't know how to describe it maybe mediocre or yeah you know just Not for as- laughs or. Yeah. Um, so, so, and what else contributed to to these thoughts, or, or where are you where are you going with it? Either when you'd like to talk. Well, about. that that's a good question. I mean, I, I so my current my current band Tableau in Korea, which I I'm just feel so honored to be playing with these musicians. Um, it's it's like that. My instrument went from harmonica, and I whistle now too. So harmonica or whistling to sort of having the band be my, my instrument, which has been such a, just such a great experience for me. So I'm really composing music for individual people and for the, the collective of the band. Uh-huh. And, the, and the music is all about collaboration. 
I mean, we've sort of taken the call and response thing a step further. There's a lot of polyrhythm stuff. If someone, or even if, if someone makes a mistake, we sort of kind of go with that and support it. And, and so I think I'm trying to, which I have not been able to do yet successfully, Jeff, uh-huh. <laughs> but I'm trying to weave anti-music components into the music to make it more beautiful. And um, I, I usually when I try, I kind of fall on my face and I don't like the results, but I think that eventually that there may be something that will come to it. I, I, so I saw, I saw a particular musician uh, at a jam session and we've all kind of witnessed this. Th- this person happened to be a harmonica player, but uh, they, they kind of sat in and they, the harmonica was very out of tune. They played very loudly, like almost ear damaging loud with yeah. the rest of the band who was not loud. Yeah. They, they stay, they took a soul that was like, you know, it's 19 choruses or whatever. And then the guitar player started to solo and they couldn't not play for one chorus and started to play on top of the guitar. I mean, they just broke every rule, every etiquette. Yeah, yeah. And this person was like anti-music. <laughs> it was, it was, it was so interesting to me. And, and I spoke with the person afterwards and I talked about these concepts in a very gentle way. And yeah, the person didn't really say anything, but when I saw the person another time, they you know, said, Hey, Al, you know, I think I've been thinking about what you said. He said I think, I think I am kind of more into the anti-music stuff. <laughs> wow, it, was you like, said- it was like, <laughs> it was so validating for me to hear someone kind of own it. And, and uh, so, but also when I was in Ecuador, I, I heard these shamans at, at these ceremonies play just beautiful spiritual music. And again, the intent, the intent comes from this place of, of spirituality and purity. So it's sort of like, you know, one of my favorite musicians, Mahalia Jackson. I mean, when, when she sings always the, the place that the music is coming from to me is the entity of music or, or I mean, she would say God or spirituality. Um, But there was one ceremony in particular where there was two musicians, Nasser and his brother uh, were playing. And um, during, so it's around a fire. We were in the Andes mountains and the community, the small town in the mountains, the, the Catholic church was also having an event that same night and they were playing loud recorded music down in the valley, but it was louder than the shaman music. Huh. So I was sitting and the shamans were to my right. And then down in the valley was this other music and the shamans, again, they had to modify how they started. They had to kind of collect themselves, tune out the other music before they played. And, and the ceremony was maybe, you know, 14 hours. So there was many hours of this. And just sometimes the music would interact. There was one time when, when Nasser, the, the shaman, played in the same key on purpose and in the same rhythm as this kind of drunken accordion player that was down in the <laughs> valley. And, and he did it for about a minute. And then, and then I, I saw him falter. And I, and I heard him play for many evenings. And... He never faltered, but he tried to join it and he couldn't do it. He had to sort of stop and collect himself and then continue his music in, in, you know, in a different rhythm. But, the, but just the, the flow between these two uh, you know, music – and the music down in the valley actually was very good. It was not – it was really interesting. They music. were having fun probably. <laughs> they were. It was, like, it was like a dedication to the people in the community that were um, – you know, that, that had like helped the community. So – but, but again, it's like it really kind of woke me up to the yin and the yang of, uh, uh, you know, of, of music and, and sort of the potential and the interaction, uh, the potential in the interaction of there to be more growth. So for, you know, a lot of the players, I mean, there's, some, as you know, amazing musicians. It just the magic that they create that comes through them whatever is so unbelievable and then you know i've been seeing sort of more and more the more i real you know appreciate it and realize that but then there's also a lot of people who just want to play we're just starting out you know um and i've felt like that's the way i've been for my whole musical career starting in you know when i picked up the harmonica and when i was 40 some um how, how does this 
you know, information or knowledge about the music and anti music and the yin and the yang and intention. What does that? How, how does what does that mean for me or for other people in this situation? I, I think awareness of it. I think awareness of it is is crucial, um, and I think to to grow as a musician, you have to dig. You have to dig into yourself. You you have to make you have to make sure that there aren't minions of anti music kind of taking over or bleeding in, and we have to catch ourselves. So by recording yourself and listening to yourself and getting feedback from other people and collaborating, you dig into yourself and you figure out: Am I? Is this a lick that I that I sort of know that I'm playing because I'm insecure right now, or is this? Is, does this sound good? Is it, you know? Is this? Let me listen to myself. I mean, so there's this constant assessment of yourself, right? right. And it's not just. It's it, certainly skill. You know, it, it is so important um, uh, to, to practice and to develop the skills. One one of this one of the things that I have a really hard time with is there are a lot of unskilled musicians that are playing their hearts out, and that that combination to me is very difficult to stomach sometimes it's and it's it's very common i mean you hear it on the radio i hear it all the time um so it's important to really study the people the masters you know you have to study them and listen to them with like a fine tooth comb you have to go through their stuff and see what they're doing and then and then apply it to yourself uh and dig into yourself deeply i mean i, I was listening to some of my old my recordings not from that long ago from a band i was in a couple years ago and gosh, I'll tell you, Jeff, I, I, I had this realization that like almost all of my solos were kind of formulaic. I was doing these mm -hmm. similar things in each of my solos. And it, not, not, not the same notes necessarily, but the, but the structure. I, you know, the first course, I would sort of do this. The second course, I would build and start, you know. And I don't want to do that. I, I, you know, improvisation is really is what I love the most. And I... I want it to be spontaneous and in the moment and maybe connected to the musicians I'm playing with or connected to the entity of music because, because I, I've been spending a lot of time just trying to increase the amount of time I can stay in the zone where I do feel like that the spirit of music is kind of pointing and telling me what mm -hmm. to do and telling me what to play. And that's mm. where my music's the best. And it doesn't, I don't even like taking credit for it. I know that's sort of a cliche, but I don't, I, I, I feel like I'm an instrument for, for the entity of music. If I practice and if I stay at it and if I dig and if I can eradicate things like, you know, ego or trying to impress someone or trying to do something. Another thing is trying to do something that's very technical on your instrument. Like that, that, you know, in the harmonica community, we, we you know, uh, Jimmy Gordon, dear friend of mine yeah. calls them o o over blahs instead of overblows because there's a lot of people that do this, this technique that you and I are aware of. That's yeah. very difficult, but it, often it doesn't sound good or, or a guitar player that's played incredibly fast just for, not that fast music can't be beautiful, but it's just for the sake of look what I can do or look at this technical thing I can do. And to me, that steps away from the entity of music. It's, um, it's just another trap. And there are many, many traps. Yeah. <laughs> so we have to dig into ourselves all the time and, and sort of push this. Yeah. I, boy, I tell you, it's, it, on the one hand, it's hard. This learning the, Music, learning a, the guitar, and being in my sixth—is this March? Maybe it's my seventh decade. Um, but it's so fun and so challenging. Learning up the neck, you know, learning how these things interrelate. Being able to move your hands around and get, you know, hit the right chord at the right time. I mean, it's 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 still coming. It seems like it's gonna, you know, be there for a long time. Um, yeah. But it's it's fascinating. I mean, what does this say for, you know, non-musicians? How, do, how does the music, non-music thing, how does that affect non-musicians? I mean, I think everybody, you know, we, but we've talked about children who are very musical. Uh, and I kind of feel like everybody is a musician. Everybody is music. But if you're not playing music, how do these, I mean, is there something there to know about that that impacts non-musicians as well well I, that's a good question i i, I mean non-musicians 
love music often. And, and, and the, the reasoning, I mean, if you, you know, if you, if you study music, it really changes your perspective on music, what you like, what you don't like, because you're learning about it. You're, you have a, a deeper level of understanding of the music. So for non-musicians, you know, a lot of people love music because there's a nostalgic experience that they connected to when they first heard the song back in the day, or, or it just makes people feel good, or there's a certain tone that they like, and and all of that is fine. And there's nothing, there, you know, all of that can be lovely and beautiful. But I think what I'm talking about is a little bit different. It's 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 taking music uh, very seriously. The musicians that I play with are are very serious about the music and I am too. I mean, it's, again, it's my life's work. It's, yeah. it's, um, so, so I think, I mean, I think it's, you know, when you get inside something very deeply, it, it does change the landscape. You and know, if you're going to talk to a, prof a, a professional, really in any profession, you know, a, a, um, an astrophysicist or a, uh, a professional athlete or, or anything, you, the, the, the answers would be very different for someone that's, that has been in that right, learning, right. It's devoting their life, 10,000 hours mastering it, you know, all these. So, but, but the, but there's not necessarily, or maybe there is, you know, a, a God, a spirit of baseball or of something else the same way as music. I mean, music seems to have a, it, it, it seems to me a little more elemental or fundamental or even godlike than baseball. I, I don't know about that. I, I, I started making a list of all the living entities. <laughs> and, and my list my list was long. I think movement is certainly one. I mean, dance, you know, and, yeah. and, and you know, when an athlete, when a baseball player is really swinging right, it's like a, it's like a beautiful dance move. I mean, True. so yeah. I, I think that I do think that there are, it, it sort of harkens back to sort of the Greek god. I think they were on to something, you know, sort of these gods that were alive that, that are interacting with, with people. Uh -huh. um, I, I, I don't really use the word god so much. Uh, I mean, it's kind of a – but 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 I'm okay with it. I mean, I, but I do believe that there are many, many things that are alive, maybe everything. And I also believe that everything is is one. I mean – Oh, yeah. There's no. I, I've been filming the microcosmos on my on my phone, which is so cool. So I, you know, I get a drop of, of lake water or something, and I've been looking at these minuscule, these single celled organisms, and and you know, it's <laughs> they have awareness. Yeah. Uh, and there's also like these incredible stories about some of them, like the hydra that you can actually blend up. And then if you put the cells that you've blended together, it reforms back into the living creature. I mean, there's like these, but, but my point is that, that every living thing that I've encountered from people to the single celled organism and everything in between is interdependent on the biosphere of the earth. Yes. And, and, you know, and we are, we are walking biospheres ourselves with a gut full of bacteria yep. and, and things living on our skin and our, so we are all one. We all, come from the same code we are and i think it's important to recognize that uh as well that's you know i as you know i did a lot of work in sort of this love and fear thing and wrote wrote some books peace and forgiveness and heaven is everywhere and i was really trying to explore love and fear and a lot and i did come to the you know the thought for myself that it seems to me that love is that oneness you know maybe even more than just an understanding of it, but the closer you get to an understanding of it, as opposed to a perception that we're, you're separate, and that leads to a lot of you know, sort of human issues, I think, in society. But I, I, I agree with your perspective about oneness and, and everything all being part of the same thing. Yes. So what do yeah, you... It would be interesting to see with, with all the discoveries and, and, you know, there's like... The, the, astron the discoveries in astronomy right now are happening like many times per week, you know, especially with the, the Hubble and, and all these other telescopes that we now have, the radio ones. The, so I, I think that we're going to have to adjust some of our ethnocentric thinking, yeah. <laughs> you know, as, as we sort of venture out and, 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 you know, I mean, I believe that mother earth is a living entity, you know, Gaia. Uh, I mean, I, yeah. That's kind of was confirmed in my work with in Ecuador, but but 
it's just, I think that we're going to have to start adjusting some of our old belief systems, our old spiritual beliefs to accommodate for what we've learned, you know, and, um, so that's very, very exciting to me to yeah. sort of see that. And you think things are changing? I do. I believe that there is, I believe that mass consciousness is growing. And this is my new goal. I mean, at least for the last three or four months is I, I want to I write and make music that's going to help mass consciousness grow. And I've been, I've been studying protest music around the world, and that's happening all over. I mean, my son is in Hong Kong, and he's been sending me some really beautiful protest music. Um, when I was in Ecuador, the, the, you know, the government was bombing the people at one point, and um, it, they're, they're, the people are rising. <clears throat> I think that has been a, a recent theme um, and you know, it's, it's about mass consciousness, especially with the, the tools that we have now, the internet where, where information can be exchanged so quickly uh, and effectively, I think that there is a shift and it's, it's scary, but it's also very exciting, uh, simultaneously. Yeah. I mean, I, I couldn't agree with you more about this. I mean, it does seem like there's a shift. It's scary out there, all these authoritarian regimes, you know, we have in the U.S., it's a big problem, and we practically have fascism right here, right now. And, you know, I don't know if that's a yin and yang with democracy, but it, but it is scary, and we hate to lose everything we have. So, I mean, I've kind of... It is. Yeah. <laughs> kind of... You can't, have, you can't have Obama unless you have Trump, right? I mean, there, <laughs> there's, some tr yeah. there's some truth to that to the yin and yang of politics. Yeah, we yes. have to be careful not to let people oppress the masses to feed the elite. I mean, that happens all over the world. Um, and we have, to, we have to be in that fight. Uh, yes. But it, it does seem like it's a worthy thing to do. I mean, that's kind of the, the goal and mission of this uh, Planetary Gig Society and these podcasts and this new video show that we're starting is just to explore more about that power of music uh, so that people can maybe see the commonalities see you know not a brahma the world is sound and and how much we can we can learn from it and how much we can grow yes. and, and and evolve together in a way that would be so much fun and hip and wonderful as opposed to oh, you know yeah. sh you know shooting each other and stuff <laughs> of course. And, 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 I, and to learn, I mean, that, so just experiencing some of the music in, in South America, for example, I mean, it was, I learned so much from hearing the, the, the shamans play that, so that, so they, they have different rhythmic instruments like a maraca or, or there was sort of a feather thing that I couldn't look at it too closely that was shaken that made this beautiful rhythm, but the rhythm, there's something about the rhythm that is, it's different. It's like, it's like the, there's, there's different rhythmic pockets. My brother used to call them pockets in jazz. You know, Lester Young might play really behind the beat in this beautiful pocket. A lot of the R&B music that I love, the soul music is, is in sort of a different pocket. Religious music has sort of a different, like the yeah, rhythm comes yeah. from a different, it's like, it's like another part of the entity of music. It might be an R maybe, or a, an eye or a strand of hair. I don't know, but, but it's, but it's, there's different. I mean, even heavy metal is sort of way on top of the beat, almost too fast, but stays in the beat. There's these different places that you can play from, and they're unique. And, and to me, that's so incredible that you know. So, so I went to Ecuador and, and I heard these shamans play these rhythms, and and they're they're very accurate. They're very crisp, and the tempo is in this place that's it's trance like, and it's hard it's hard for me to even describe. Uh, you know, verbally, uh, what makes it different or unique or beautiful? I can just tell you that it is, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's, uh, I mean, maybe it was the tempo, maybe it's the, the drive behind it. Maybe it's the intent. A lot of the shamans like look up to the sky when they play, you know, that, that the intent that they're coming from is, is Gaia. I mean, it's, it's the, it, it's they're they're again they're like conduits yeah deep um, connected yeah so i'm fascinated and i think in different parts of the world there are these different 
and I don't know if pocket is the only word I really know to use, but these different sort of uh, frames or vehicles or mediums, rhythmic mediums to carry beautiful music. Yeah, well, it seems to me like it's a pretty good goal, Alan, uh, to, you know, to explore music to try to raise, help raise the consciousness of the, I guess, the people and everything else. We've got, you know, Australia's on fire. <laughs> So, there's there must be something that music can help do that way. So you got any particular yeah. plans or? Well, I, I, I I'm very interested in recording nature. I've been I've been I just learned this is fairly new information that plants emit ultrasonic sounds. Mm -hmm. And there I, and I looked on the internet. And I researched it. And there's a, there's you know going back I think even to the 60s and 70s they were hooking up electrodes to plants. Right and converting them into a sound signal, which to me isn't the same. These are ultrasonic sounds that plants are probably communicating with um, that can be recorded meters away. So these are mm. actual sounds that the plants are using that some insects can hear. There's even, uh, you know, there's maybe that there's an insect uh, a pollinating sound and the, and the plant produces a sound to attract a particular insect that pollinates or they, they've learned. There's a recent study that's kind of sparked a lot of this where plants that are being cut or under drought conditions emit more sounds. Mm. Um, so, so. I'm I'm fascinated to combine the nature nature music. Um, I just posted a, a short Instagram video of of playing harmonica to a sloth that I filmed traversing some power yeah, lines. I in saw Costa that. Rica. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And and so I'm I'm very interested in sort of combining even the microcosmos. I'm putting music to some of the microcosmos videos that I've been taking. But I I want to incorporate that. I want to incorporate physics into my music they I, I think i told you they recorded or they didn't record it they saw uh the lowest note that we've ever discovered emitted by a black hole Whoa. and it was a b flat it was a b flat and i think it was i don't know 88 octaves below middle c or something like that <laughs> um, but the only reason they saw it is because you know sound needs a medium uh you know it needs molecules to to move but they could see that the black hole was emitting these sound waves that were like thousands of light years across for one sound wave in the gases surrounding the black hole. Really? So, so I, I'm, you know, and NASA's put out some, some sounds of like different planets and, and that are very fascinating to me. So I want to combine like sound and physics and nature into my music, but I really just want to create beautiful music uh, with messages that that help people grow and help mass consciousness shift and grow. So, uh, and like I said, that's a that's an awesome goal, one that I can buy into. You know, if I can learn the neck, I can do it. <laughs> no, I mean, I I know it's broader than that, but it's it's a, it's an amazing it's, journey to do that. But I love learning the neck. I mean, that is a great analogy. I, when I play, when I'm studying harmonica or the whistling recently, or even the maracas, I'm, I'm the, the very small muscle memory things that we have to develop, the little technical things that we have to do are extremely important. Yeah. They're, they're just, you know, they, they just, once you, once you learn those things, it just becomes a new language that you can use and speak. And yeah. it's like learning another word or, so yes, stick with the neck, Jeff. <laughs> yeah. this, is, this is the year of learning the neck. It, it feels really good. I'm, I'm, I feel better about it. It just, I don't know. This music thing is is the bomb, isn't it? It's just fabulous. It is. Yeah. We also have to. We have to. I've been taking notes, trying to to, to find ways to learn and get better faster. Like, like what, what can I eliminate? How can I do this, engage in this process and, and learn and get better quicker? <laughs> you know, what, uh -huh. what's going to help me? What? So that's another thing I think it's important for people to assess, it, you know, it's to maybe to put the instrument down when it's time. It might be one thing, but there's a lot of ways that you can do that. Yeah. Uh, so. yeah. You can be more, more effective and at certain times and, I don't yeah. have to play that that one solo that I'm learning forty seven thousand times. You know, you can do it, have fun, and then let it go and come back. Kind of. 
Right, you can drop it. Or you could play it really slowly, or you could play it in a different key, or you could play it really fast, you could play it on a different instrument, or you could sing while you play it. I mean, there's like lots of ways to sort of attack learning something. To, to use the minions of the, the music minions. Yes, yes. And also, what am I going to say? Identify the, the anti-music minions that might be inhibiting you, like... Are, am I trying to do this perfectly? Am I trying to do this? I mean, I, I certainly love learning what's come before me. I mean, I, you know, I've dissected and, and transcribed solos, nuance for nuance, note for note. But there might be a point when it's time to say, hey, I'm going to interpret this in my own way. Or um, So, yeah, we have to identify the anti-music means that might be inhibiting us as well. You know, am I doing too many drugs or drinking too much maybe i need to eliminate that am i not spending enough time practicing am i oh there's so many many possibilities yeah yeah well i'll tell you what we'll just have to plan to uh have another conversation a little further down the road uh hopefully see you soon but um you know wherever you'll be korea or whatever we'll keep in touch and and uh check up on this conversation see how we're doing yeah sure yeah and i'm so excited about your your uh, uh filming project that you're talking was it planetary film project planetary music project exploring oh, okay. the power planetary. of music yeah and we're, yeah. we've uh, we've got oh, i can't wait to see that i know you're on your way to nepal right I'm gonna yeah i'm spending five weeks in india and nepal soon and we'll see um what happens with that but it just seems like a great opportunity to actually Sort of doing the podcast, but from a video perspective in different places to continue mm. to explore this. What is this power of music? How does this, how does this magic happen? You know, um, right. Because it's vibrations. Yeah, vibrations. Absolutely. It has the potential to move us for sure. Oh boy. So I don't, I mean, maybe, maybe we're out of time. I mean, I, I could talk about that thing that I was hesitant to talk about if you like, or we could just call it here and then. Um, I think we should uh, talk about it and then you can decide. So in, in the first interview, I, I, you asked me about some of my mentors and I, I was very fortunate to have these beautiful people that, you know, as a young child that mentored me uh, in band and school. And, and one of them I, I brought up uh, was, uh, uh, a particular person that I spent man, a huge amount of time with and, and in a big band. I mean, we were traveling all over the country and abroad playing even when I was 14, 15 years old um, for many years. And that person was accused of, of sexually assaulting some of the children. Oh. And, uh, and, and, the person was actually abroad. He was still, you know, 20, 20 some years later was still doing this, this work with kids and music. Um, and it really, it really was difficult for me to process. I had had a couple experiences with this person. I was not sexually abused, but there were some close calls that I, in hindsight that I can see now very clearly. Um, at the same time that I had learned about, this person who had been a mentor, my brother was very involved with this person, was still working with them. Um, I I learned about the 17 year cicadas. You're familiar with those, right? Oh, we yeah. have them in Virginia. I was actually, so the, I was born in 1953, and that's the 17 year cicada year. So ah, so you're, so yeah. I, you, I can tell when they're coming if I can just multiply 17. <laughs> that's right yeah. that's right so so when people say what's your sign maybe you should just say cicada, cicada yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah so so uh but in particular i learned uh uh from this learn your land i love this guy adam harrington who does these videos but he he was looking for a particular cicada that gets infected by a mold and the mold has co-evolved with the cicadas. And the mold may only appear every 17 years as well when the cicadas climb out of the ground, huh. go into the trees. And actually, the cicada is the loudest animal in the world. Is it? Which is really interesting. Yeah, they make the loudest sound decibel uh, of any animal in the world. So, so they climb up into the trees by the millions, right? You know, we've seen them, we've heard them. But there's a, like 5% of these cicadas get infected by this mold. 
and and most of them it does not it doesn't doesn't do anything to them they just live their lives mm-hmm. and the mole has there's no there's no symptoms but maybe a smaller percentage of that 5% like maybe 1% their stomachs fall off and yeah. in the place of the stomach is this white fuzz and the and the mold which is a cocktail of drugs one of which is psilocybin in magic mushrooms but there's Ooh. a cocktail of drugs in this mold that takes control of the cicada's brain and it makes the cicada do these things to spread the mold. So, so even if it's a male cicada, it makes it act like a female and do the, the, the female wing flapping thing to attract other male cicadas to mate with it and to spread the mold. Or it controls their brains and makes them fly way above the forest canopy, which they never do, and just flap and flap until they die, spreading and raining the this fuzzy stomach mold all over the forest floor. Wow. So, and then I was thinking about that again, you know, it might be horrible for that small percent of cicadas, but maybe the cicadas are stronger having to have evolved dealing with this particular mold. And the mold mm. maybe has been conducive to the strength of the colonies of the cicada. I mean, these are all, I'm just surmising these possibilities. Yeah. And, and maybe the cicadas, in their defense, have made the mold stronger. So there's, again, this perhaps what doesn't look like a symbiotic relationship to us, but maybe in the big picture, it is. And I started to, and I want to be very careful with this because I don't, I know that these issues are very sensitive around someone that's willing to destroy people's lives. You know, I've been a counselor for 30 years, so I've worked with so many yeah, yeah. people that have experienced this kind of physical trauma. So someone that's willing to destroy children's lives for the sake of kind of getting off is, is a really is a really dark sickness. And, and the person that I'm referring to actually killed himself before uh, he went to trial. Um, but... I saw this bizarre parallel just in my own experiences. I, 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 I got closer to these people that I, I haven't talked to in many years, just in the process of trying to heal and talk about what happened. And, you know, did, did you have any idea that anything happened to you? It, there was like this, <laughs> this sort of collective growth and intimacy that arose out of this incredible, incredibly dark, mm. horrific thing. And, and, uh, you know, and, and the victims, I mean, I can't even imagine, you know, uh, it's just, it's so sad, yeah. but I, I start to wonder sort of from a collective experience, you know, this, like, uh, it's, is there a purpose or a place stronger? or something? Are, are we, yeah. Are we stronger because we've had to fight people like this? Yeah. You no. Know, are we? I don't know the answers. I really don't. But I, but I, it's part of that yin and yang. And actually, yeah. it's, it kind of was a catalyst for me to, to, to think about anti music and music coexisting and, and their functions and how they intertwine. And, um, but again, I want to be very careful because, you know, my heart goes out to anyone that has experienced anything like that. And, and I, yeah, you're not trying to legitimate. certainly devoted. No, I don't condone it. And, you know, nothing of the sort. I've, you know, I've spent my decades helping people with, through these sort of things, and also working with perpetrators and well in my time, I have worked with them as well. So it's, um, but I think, I think a conversation about some of these bigger picture, these collective perspectives, are very important. Yeah, well, even you know the the wrong the wrong quote notes help us play the right notes and and being on right. the, off the beat and knowing that helps you get on the beat and so there you know there are Absolutely. places for all these anti music or anti sort of human or anti social types of things not that that makes them good or that we want to you know emulate them or promote them or what have you but interesting right. perspective but we have we have to remove our judgment to assess things sometimes. And, and yeah, and what did Miles Davis say? There's, there's space, there's music in the space, of course. And actually, one of the, a guitar player I was playing with, Unsuk, who, dear friend of mine, who I just recorded with, he said that you actually, a musician not only communicates with the musical notes, but they also have to communicate with the space, yeah. which 
ah, just like hit me right in my heart. Oh, it was yeah, so that's beautiful. a big Wooten thing too. So, Joseph Wooten is all about the space, and Victor talks about that in his book as well. So mm. all this is tying together, and uh, be looking forward to the next conversation about this. Oh, thanks so much, Jeff. It's just been a beautiful thing to be able to talk to you about some of these ideas, and and I oh. wish the best to your endeavors and can't wait to collaborate with you again in the future. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, thanks so much. It's great connecting and we'll definitely uh, be in touch on this. So thanks, Alan Holmes. Really appreciate it. And uh, we'll see everybody soon. You've been listening to Planetary Gig Talk, Tales of Music and Magic. I'm your host, Jefferson Glassy. Chief Spiritual Dude of the Planetary Gig Society. We talk with musicians and others about the power of music and how we can use music to help create a better world. Please check out our website, www.planetarygigs.org, for information about some of the organizations promoting music and musicians, resources about the power of music, books, movies, articles, including new research on music and the brain. We welcome your support. The Planetary Gig Society is a Section 501c3 charitable organization, and you can donate on the website. You also can receive a free email signature block demonstrating your support for Planetary Gig Society. Please follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook, at Planetary Gigs, and we want to thank fabulous musician and teacher Eric Weinberg of Little Eric Studios for the Planetary Gig Talk music titled, Chill Kid, It's Saul. So, please check out Planetary Gig Talk on iTunes, Google Play, and Stitcher. Subscribe and hear all the upcoming episodes. Thanks very much.